Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. And by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. Most in-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash ham nation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 355 for June 13th, 2018. All about fractal antennas. Hey, hello everybody, it's Don, and uh, my call is Alpha Echo 5 Delta Whiskey. Tonight, Bob Heil, K9EID, is out doing whatever it is that Bob Heil does. So uh, we shall miss him terribly until he returns back probably next week. But we've got uh, the rest of the normal uh, cast of idiots with us tonight. As uh, you will plainly be able to see right now, we've got uh, George, we've got Dan, we've got Gordo. We're going to have Amanda coming in here a little bit. We're going to have Val. We've got an action-packed show. So let's go around the horn real quick and see what's going on up in Jackson, Mississippi with George. How are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing pretty well, Don. There's no thunderstorm at the moment, although we've had several pass through uh, in the past few days. I had a lot of trees cut in my backyard. Well, I say a lot. It was really only two, but a lot of limbs cut. You can see the sky back there now, so I've got new <laughs> antenna possibilities. Good deal. Yeah, we've had some thunderstorms here, too. In fact, uh, we had a power pop earlier and uh, had to reset uh, some things, reset some clocks, reset the Wi-Fi. But I think we're, I think we're in good shape now because the lightning has uh, pretty much – it's pretty much over. I am unplugged. <laughs> Don't want to do that again. Let's see what's going on with Dan. Dan, how are you tonight? Oh, we're doing just fine. I uh, had an interesting day today. Uh, did some changes in the mobile. So we're back up and running on the mobile. And how many watts are you pushing in that thing? Uh, 1,100 watts. Jesus. <laughs> QRP, come on, huh? Dan. Fast up. Yeah, come on. You can get you can get that other 400. Come on, Dan. Come on. <laughs> 1,100 watts we, works good between friends, right? Um, 1100 yeah. watts in a mobile. Yep. Wow. Well, keep trying. You'll get to be one of the big boys one of these days. Let's go over to Costa Mesa and see what's going on with uh, Gordon and uh, give us some short shots if you would. Gordon, and how are you doing tonight? Everything okay over there? Uh everything is just fine and no short shots tonight. So when you come back around to me or if I'm to do it now, we've got live shots, but before this ham handheld radio field guide. We showed it to you uh, last week. Um, it is specifically for handheld radios and including the Chinese radios. It's written by KF7 Charlie 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 at ARRL.net. And uh, Andrew Cornwall is an expert in making it easy to program and put into memory and do the CTCSS on almost any handheld. And in the last couple of days, Don, I've consulted this book regularly because someone brought over either a Chinese handheld or one that I was not familiar with, and uh, the book works. So I encourage all of you to go to uh, his, um, uh, send him an email, Kilo Fox 7 Charlie, 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 and uh, get more details about this book. I know there's other little uh, guides on uh, how to program a handheld that go into so much detail. This one just gives you uh, the basics to get on the air. And speaking on the air, <clears throat> um, we're going to be trying this. This is the Bob Heil Amplified 25-watt speaker that goes with the parametric um, receive device that we have right here. So, Don, uh, would you like my demo now or later, Don? That I'd like it now, but I have a question about that book real quick. You say it covers uh, it covers the the big name brands, the uh, 
uh, Kenwood, uh, Yezu, Icoms, and uh, also the Chinese. Does it cover any DMR in that book? Uh, no DMR yet, but he says that he will very shortly uh, come out with probably an individual book or an insert on digital mobile radio handhelds from many of the uh, suppliers. So soon. Yeah, that's probably a good thing because DMR is hot right now and getting getting hotter uh, by the minute. All right, Gordon, go ahead and uh, tell us all about what it is you're going to tell us all about. All right. Well, I'm going to actually do a demo and this was during the VHF UHF contest uh, this past weekend. Um, not great conditions on six meters on Saturday for the West Coast while you East folks uh, were working up a storm. But Sunday, we had some pretty good single hop and double hop. Here's a double hop signal. And this is what it sounded like before I started working with the new parametric uh, receive uh, add-on uh, that goes right to the audio output of this very old ICOM 718. We wanted to do it with a radio without any DSP, although the new 718s have DSP in them. Uh, this was Bear. This is a Christmas Island radio that we've had down there for, gosh, about 12 years, and it's still cranking. But take a listen to this incoming call before I start to mess with each of the yellow buttons. Now, I put a little yellow tag on them so I know exactly which one I'm dealing with. But here we go. Uh, an incoming signal from a double hop station running, well, he'll tell you, not 1,100 watts like Dan. So he's coming in okay, but I'm going to get rid of a lot of the bass and listen to what happens um, when I uh, reduce a little bit of the bass. Um, the rig is uh, FT817. Oh boy, that made a big difference. Now I'm going to go to the mid. And remember, this is not like a pot that goes from zero to whatever. Uh, you're able to actually tailor the audio of his voice to take a peek. And it's the mid that's going to make a big difference. Take a listen when I now adjust the mid on his incoming audio signal. So he's running five watts, double hop on six meters. Yeah, conditions were very good. Now we're going to go to the very high end and we're going to peak up uh, where I think his voice is just going to come through loud and clear. Wow, so it really makes a difference. So if you have an older transceiver, uh, without any DSP or without any equalizer tied into it, this is something serious to consider. But we've only worked with it for a couple of days, and very shortly, I'm going to take this uh, to the field on field day. But I'm going to test it this coming weekend because I want to transmit <clears throat> with a nearby antenna, make sure we don't get RF into it. But Bob assures me this is so well sealed that there'll be no RF problems. And the neat thing about it is, it makes a very old radio, like this old ICOM 718 from Christmas Island. Uh, it's going to make it sound like a magic radio when you're able to tailor it with the parametric device that uh, Bob Heil has come out with. So <clears throat> there'll be more testing, but as you heard today, it uh, really makes a difference on accentuating that area where the voice sounds clear and the background noise is lessened because it's not of the right audio frequency. And that's all I know about this unit. It's got a whole bunch of uh, other knobs and things, but uh, the main ones were those that I just put a little yellow tag on, and they make all the difference. So, Don, that's my story. I'm going to turn it back to you because you know which way it goes, and I'll let those uh, on uh, watching uh, know that uh, if you go to tune me in tonight, I'll try and get on 75 or 40 meters, but I will be dropped off because we have more guests coming on the air tonight on Ham Nation. Don, back to you in that wild shirt. Pretty slick little unit that Bob has come out with. Uh, it sounds great, and I tell you, it's nice to see an analog meter 
a nice round analog <laughs> steam gauge on the front of that thing. There's just something about that. It takes me back to watching those uh, watching those analog meters on those broadcast consoles uh, all those years ago. And everything now is bar graphs and all this other happy noise. But no, man, give me a steam gauge any day. That's good stuff. Love it. All right. Thank you, uh, Gordon. Always good to uh, have you on the uh, on the proceedings tonight. Let's switch over to Dan, N9LVS. Dan has been handling our Show Me Your Shack uh, video duties of late, and he has uh, a couple of entries for us tonight. Dan, good evening. Good to see you on tonight. Good evening. Glad to see you as well, Don. Yeah, we got a little bit of Show Me Your Shack uh, videos. I've got uh, the uh, home shacks, and then uh, our second video will be the mobile shacks. So let's take a look at the video. This is Show Us Your Shack. An installment of Shack video sent in by you, the viewers. We start out with Bill, AB4BJ, and his nice HF Shack. Then we have Joe, K9JPP, with a very nice display. Mark, and the Zero MRK, in his Shack. Giovanni, N8IWK, has a nice little shack. Pascal, VA2PV, is preset on the HF bands. And Mark, W9OP, has quite the setup. George, W9EVT, has a massive selection of radios, dating all the way back to World War II. Looks like WA2TP is set up very nice as well. John, K2AFE, can definitely do a little multitasking with this setup. And Gary, KB9AIT, can definitely do some serious contesting here. But one of the ultimate contest stations has to be Paul. W0AIH. And that is Show Us Your Shack. So that's the base station shacks, uh, but I got quite a few mobile shacks as well. A lot of people, uh, they have the CCNRs and the HOAs and that where they can't do a base shack. So they're kind of limited to what they can do mobile. And uh, let's show you what some of those shacks look like. This is Show Us Your Shack, mobile edition. So the first shack we're going to start out with is my own. This is the N9LVS mobile shack, followed by Tony's KD8RTT. Scott, KE4WFM. Has a pretty nice mobile shack. Ellen, KD9HIW, has a nice little setup as well. Les, W9LRT, has a neat little setup here. And Michael, VK5ZEA, has a nice stack of radios. And Jerry, VE6AB, has a very nice setup. And let's not forget the portables. Randall, K9RMR, shows off his nice little ballfang radio, as well as his QSL card. And this is a very old install of a mobile ham radio, and you think it's hard to install a radio in a car today. And there you have it. Show us your shack mobile. Okay, that was the mobiles and the bases. Um, a, th a few things on the uh, show me your shack. When you're sending in your um, uh, shack video videos or your... Um, pictures uh, for the Show Me Your Shack segment. I need large pictures. I had to, to cancel out quite a few of the uh, pictures uh, this time because uh, I was getting thumbnails of uh, 230 by 230, and I just can't uh, put that in a video. Uh, it doesn't uh, render very well at all. So send me as big a picture as you can, and we'll uh, try to do these Shack videos again as soon as we can. Um, another thing is, is I'm looking forward to seeing all your field day videos. Send me any field day video that you have. And um, what I'm really kind of looking for is the oddball video. Um, everybody knows the pristine field day. Nothing happens. Everything works just right. 
but everybody knows that you've had field days where, uh, guess what, you're underwater or, or a puddle or whatever, um, and you can't uh, get to the radios for a couple hours. Or like we had a couple of years ago, uh, guy was running 80 meters and got up about 2 o'clock in the morning, and he was sleeping on the radio. Um, so um, those kind of pictures I want to see. I want to see something a bit unusual. So we have that, and we also have the field day videos, and then the show me your shack. Some of you show me your shack pictures. Uh, where to send it to would be n9lvs at arrl.net. Well, that just about does it for my segment. Now off to ICOM. Calling all stations. Make sure you grab your ICOM gear for the most popular on-air event, Field Day, June 23rd and 24th. Let ICOM help you make the most contacts or practice for emergency situations. The SDR every ham wants, the IC7610, and it's just in time for Field Day. This high-performance SDR has the ability to pick out the faintest signals, even in the presence of stronger adjacent channels. The new ICOM 7610 is a direct sampling, software-defined radio that will change the world's definition of a SDR transceiver. RF direct sampling system, 110 dB RMDR, independent dual receivers, and dual digicell. Don't forget to bring along the perfect field day companion, the IC7300. Ideal for the ham on the go, it's a high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. The sky's no limit for the IC9100. It's an all-in-one HF, VHF, UHF rig. No matter if you're working DX QSOs, RIDI, D-Star DV, Satellite, or even Moon Bounce, ICOM's years of experience is working along with you. Independent dual receivers, satellite mode, built-in antenna tuner, and digital IF filter. Learn more about all the great ICOM radios for Phil Day. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur today. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation. Register to win some great swag prizes like t-shirts and hats. And while you're there, learn how you can win the monthly grand prize drawing for new radio. For June, that new radio is the ID31A Plus Great Entry-Level D-Star Handheld. It's a UHF transceiver with IPX7 waterproof rating. It has the new terminal mode and access point mode that enables you to make D-Star calls through the Internet, even from areas where no D-Star repeater is accessible. It's got DV fast data mode and DV and FM repeater search function and a lot more. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this in each episode of Ham Nation and register to win. Sign up, good luck, and don't forget to follow Icom America Inc. on Facebook and Twitter. And now, because I'm not Will Banks, here's Don <laughs> with all the news. Yeah, we'll get into uh, Amateur Radio Newsline, and we've got video from uh, Dr. T as well, but I wanted to... Uh, uh, I wanted to say hello to our listeners on WTWW on 5085 and uh, 15.810. And uh, the email address to WTWW for signal reports, especially on the new 15.810 frequency, is email at WTWW.us. And also speaking of field day, Dan was talking about field day. It's coming up. And uh, on uh, the QSO show, Ted Randall always takes phone calls from field day operations. Uh, talking about what they're doing, what kind of bands they're working, uh, what kind of contacts they're making, what's on the grill, uh, what kind of chilies being made at the chili pot. Uh, you know, everybody has their own little field day uh, secrets and tips and tricks and recipes and whatnot. Uh, just listen to WTWW. He'll give the phone number out. I don't have it here in front of me off the top of my head. But uh, listen to WTWW and, or email him for that phone number, and you can call up during field day and be put on the air live on WTWW and talk up your field day 
uh, set up. So it's always a fun time. I've co-hosted with, with him on that last year, I believe it was, for a few hours. And man, it was fun hearing from uh, all the different field day locations around the country. So there you go, WTWW, we appreciate them simulcasting the audio to Ham Nation. Now, let's go ahead and get into the news of the week from Amateur Radio Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 2,119, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, June 13th, 2018. Someone named Marconi has successfully completed a contact by wireless across a body of water. Almost 120 years after this transmission created unprecedented news. And this is, of course, a different Marconi. Imagine a QSO with a Marconi. If you had been at the Cape Cod National Seashore on Thursday, May 31st, you would not have needed your imagination. At the Wellfleet Marconi station there, the rig was tuned to 14.224 megahertz. At the microphone was Guglielmo Marconi's daughter, Princess Elettra Marconi. Shortly before noon, another wireless Marconi message went out, this time to the historical Signal Hill station in Newfoundland, Canada. The special event coordinator of the Society of Newfoundland Radio Amateurs, Chris Hillier, VO, one IDX had arranged for the station VO1AA to make the contact. At the microphone in Canada was 18-year-old Aaron Kent Abbott, VO1FOX. Although Princess Electra has visited both Marconi stations on previous occasions, the moment's significance was lost to no one. The radio pioneer himself first transmitted from this New England station on January 18, 1903. Sending the first two-way wireless message from the U.S. to Europe. It was at the Newfoundland station on December 12, 1901, that Guglielmo Marconi had received that first transatlantic letter, the letter S, sent in Morse code from England. More than a century later, the event in May was no less remarkable. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Kevin Trotman, N5 PRE. To hear the QSO between Princess Electra and the Society of Newfoundland Radio Amateurs, visit our website, arnewsline.org, and click on the tab that says Extra. Fresh on the heels of the recent Museum Ships Weekend is International Museums Weekend. And in Ireland, one participating radio museum also has a Marconi connection. Although ships, castles, pumping stations and aviation establishments qualify to activate international museums, one museum near Dublin is a natural for the event. Ye old Hurdy-Gurdy Museum of Vintage Radio will be participating on Saturday and Sunday, the 16th and 17th of June, with the call sign EI0MAR. The museum is located in the Martello Tower, the site of the first telegraphy station that connected Ireland to Great Britain in 1852. It was in this tower that America's leader forest experimented with wireless telegraphy at the turn of the 20th century. The tower was also home to a Marconi receiving station that conducted experimental telegraphy communications with HMS Monarch. HAMS will be operating from that tower during the weekend and organisers say volunteer operators are needed for both SS SB and CW. The station is customarily operated by the Howth Martello Radio Group on Sundays and the site opened as a museum in 2003. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jeremy Bucci, 4NJH. Just in time for field day, the ARRL has produced some new public service announcements with someone very well known both in and out of the usual ham radio circles. The latest releases from rock legend Joe Walsh, WB6ACU, are no match for Hotel California or Live Spin Good, which are staples for so many of his fans. For ham radio operators, though, the guitarist and songwriter has landed on the charts anyway. Well, maybe more like the band plan. Joe has recorded a series of public service announcements for the American Radio Relay League, explaining the importance of ham radio and the league's advocacy role. The video and audio messages are being made available to radio and TV outlets, as well as ARRL-affiliated clubs to use at meetings or public events. The recording artist studio sessions were at league headquarters in Connecticut at W1AW. Joe's previous visits to the station included donations of some of his vintage equipment and some on-air operating that generated massive pileups. Joe's PSAs, however, are easily downloadable from the ARRL website. All you need is an eagle eye. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Mike Askins, KE5CXP. For the rest of this week's Amateur Radio News, please listen to the full Amateur Radio Newsline report online on a repeater near you or on shortwave radio station WTWW at 9930 and 5085 kilohertz. 
And that's all from the Amateur Radio News Line, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at www.arnewsline.org. With Kevin Trotman, N5PRE, Jeremy Boot, G4NJH, Mike Askins, KE5CXP, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the News Desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now here's the solar update with Dr. Tamitha Scove. A bright region has rotated into Earth view that's giving amateur radio operators something to smile about. And that mini solar storm that we expected looks like it might be a no-show. Those stories and more in the news this week. Space weather this week has remained quiet. We do have an active region that has rotated into Earth view. You can see it there off of the sun's east limb, and it has managed to boost the solar flux. So, you amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you are enjoying marginal propagation again on the bands on Earth's day side. And this could continue easily for the next two weeks as this region rotates across the Earth facing disk. Now, as far as you aurora photographers are concerned, we do have a remnant coronal hole that is rotating through the earth strike zone right now but unfortunately the part of this coronal hole that actually was giving us the best chance for some fast wind it looks like it was too far south and so the fast wind is actually going below earth if that makes any sense the earth is too far north so it doesn't look like we're going to get a solar storm from this uh from any of this fast wind we might actually see unsettled conditions, maybe a little bit of turbulent wind, but outside of that, it's probably not going to give us very much. And this means you poor aurora photographers are going to have to put your cameras on standby easily for the next two weeks. Switching to our M flare threat meter, you can see we've actually had a bit of activity when the X ray flux and also the solar flux. We were popping a few mini flares here and there back around the beginning of the month. That was from region 2712. And you can see as it, it rotated off the sun's west limb, the X ray flux just died and the solar flux died along with it. But it only lasted a day or so before you can see the X ray flux ramp back up again. That's from region 2712. 13 coming into Earth view. Now, since then, we are back into marginal propagation for the amateur radio bands. This is good news for you guys, and it looks like it will continue to be like this as long as region 2713 stays alive. Switching to your solar storm conditions, you can see the last time we actually hit storm levels was clear back on June 1st. And once that solar storm settled down a bit, we've been kind of bouncing around unsettled conditions. We did manage to reach active conditions for a short while due to a stealthy solar storm that we just couldn't detect. But it didn't last all that long, and now we're back to unsettled, even quiet conditions. And likely this will continue over the next few days because most of the fast wind is south of Earth right now. And we might get a little bit of a boost in activity over the next couple days as this remnant hole pushes through the Earth strike zone. But most likely it's going to be close to quiet. And these conditions are going to continue for the next two weeks. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we were expecting to get hit by that mini solar storm from some fast wind from that tiny finger-like part of the coronal hole that has been pushing through the Earth's strike zone. But from stereo observations, it looks like most likely that fast wind is actually going beneath Earth. Earth is just a little bit too far north to be hit by it. So over the next few days, we might get, I don't know, a wisp of it here and there, but nothing that's too intense. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting unsettled conditions with only about a 20 to 25 percent chance of a minor storm. At mid latitudes, we're expecting unsettled conditions with only about a 10 to 15 percent chance of active conditions. And these kind of sleepy conditions should last easily through this next week and probably into next week. So your war photographers, well, you're going to have to take a little vacation. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, everything is still in the green when it comes to solar flares. We have no risk for radio blackouts. We do have a single numbered region on the Earth facing disk right now. That's region 2713, and it is boosting the solar flux for you amateur radio 
operators and emergency responders. This is really good news. It's bumped us back into marginal propagation conditions on Earth's day side. And the cool thing is that we actually might get an extra boost from yet another active region that could be rotating into Earth view here in the next week. So we could boost those conditions even more. So the bands might actually be hopping here in the next week or so. So the space weather this week remains reasonably quiet. You Aurora photographers, I know we were hoping to get hit by that mini solar storm, but it looks like the solar, the fast solar wind is going south of Earth. And this means we're probably not going to get more than unsettled conditions over the next week or so, which means probably not very good aurora views even at high latitudes. So you guys may need to just kind of rest up for the next couple weeks till we get another chance at a decent solar storm. Now you amateur radio operators on the other hand, you guys are loving life because we've got a new region that's rotated into earth view and it's boosted the solar flux so that we're back into marginal conditions for radio propagation. And what's even better is in about a week, we should get yet another region rotating into earth view that will boost the solar flux even more. This is perfect timing for field day, don't you think? So the bands really may be hopping in about a week or so. Now, you GPS operators, well, you should be enjoying some decent uh, signals, pretty clean signals on Earth's day side. But just know if you're at low latitudes, in about a week, when we get that extra solar flux boost, you might see a few more issues than normal for a solar minimum sun. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. Good stuff, Dr. T. I say it every week, and, and I can't tell you enough. If you don't subscribe to her on Twitter, you're really missing out. At Tamitha Scove on Twitter, and also if you have Periscope, she occasionally does live broadcast on Periscope talking about solar weather, and she'll take uh, comments and questions via Periscope if she can. Uh, just, uh, just amazing. Uh, we're so lucky to have her on our team. So thanks, uh, Dr. Tamitha, and we'll, uh, we'll see. There you go. Talks extreme. There you go. There she is. Right there on Skype and the uh, and the Periscope thing. So definitely subscribe to her at Tamitha Scove. Another great uh, another great asset that we have to us here on the Ham Nation team is Valerie, and she's got a guest tonight. Valerie, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, and I love the news Dr. T gave because it sounds like we're going to have some good. The bands will be good for field day, so I'm excited about that. Um, yeah, we've got a great guest tonight. As you, you know, a lot of you heard, I won uh, Ham of the Year. I finally brought my award here. Hang on. But a really uh, another ham winner. It's pretty cool. What girls doesn't like diamonds, huh? Uh, another cool uh, a winner was Chip Cohen. I don't know if you guys know Chip Cohen, but he's uh, very renowned in his field. Uh, whiskey won Yankee Whiskey, and um, he actually, um, hi, Chip, welcome aboard. <laughs> uh, Chip was a DXer and a contester um, whose radio bug led him into radio astronomy and physics. There, he's got my QSL card. We work on VHF in the VHF, UHF, VHF contest. But uh, uh, he's an inventor with 48 patents, uh, ranging from fractal antennas to uh, invisible cloaks to drone zappers. Um, uh, but fractal antennas was were started in ham radio 30 years ago and now um, see a global use in the wireless and telecom and it's a ham grown innovation. And uh, Chip uh, won the uh, technical achievement from DARA this year, also won the R uh, Radio Club of America fellow this year. And he is also the recipient of the Alfred Grieb Award for engineering excellence. So uh, that's a lot of, lot of cool accolades to your name, Chip. Uh, welcome aboard. And um, you, for those of you who don't really know about fractal antennas, why don't you kind to just give us a uh, 101 on fractal antennas. Sure, so fractal antennas are uh, antennas that, that are shaped in a very interesting way. Uh, the shapes are built up from multiple scales of a simple structure to make a complex structure. And that can be either by uh, bending wires or taking surfaces or volumes and putting multiple size holes in them. And uh, a lot of them look like uh, sort of paisley shapes or interesting geometric shapes 
that you've seen artistically. Oh, there's one right there. And uh, they end up surprisingly being uh, very good antennas for, for many applications. This one is uh, uh, a shot of a three-element quad. Uh, each one of those uh, interesting-looking crosses uh, is a quad element. And instead of being a quarter wave on a side, uh, by using these fractal shapes, we can actually shrink the size down to uh, less than half that. So one of the aspects of uh, using fractals that I like to take advantage of is their ability to shrink sizes. Uh, by the way, a version of that antenna is what I, I was, I've been using in the VHF contests and uh, worked Valerie this weekend. And I'm happy to say with that antenna, I've now... Uh, exceeded 200 uh, grid squares, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with the performance. Just backing up a little bit there on the previous diagram, oh. could just go back a second. There we go. Everyone always asks me, well, you know, you're, you're reasonably loud on HF. What kind of antenna are you using? I don't see any, uh, any tower up or anything like that. And the antenna I'm using right now uh, kind of looks like an inverted V with traps on it. But they're really not traps. They're radiating sections that uh, are uh, built up of circuit boards, of uh, circuit boards that are conformal and uh, add long electrical length. So what I can do is I can take an inverted V kind of structure and actually have multiple current maxima. maxima. That's what the MMIC max stands for. And I end up with a gain antenna. It has a bunch of side lobes. But the, some of the main lobes are at very low elevations and works very well for DX. And uh, that's the principal antenna that I'm using right now for HF. Uh, would I recommend it for others? Well, you know, we're talking about making an antenna out of circuit boards. So, uh, you know, some people may be willing to do that, but they're also quite expensive. Uh, the next shot shows what one of those uh, sections looks like. And you can see it's a, a circuit board with these intricate fractal doily-like shapes. And uh, a lot of them are, uh, are shorted in the back with capacitors. And what that allows it to do is to produce, as I said, multiple current maxima on uh, a physically, uh, what looks like a physically short length. You don't have to put current maxima on an array, a half a wavelength separation. You can get them much closer and still get a fair amount of gain. So that's the objective of what I'm trying to do. The other question so, I get asked, I'm sorry, Val, go ahead. I was gonna say, so um, there's also a lot of practical applications to the fractal antenna as well, right? Oh, sure, but just before I get to that, I wanted to show everyone says, what can I build that's simple? So the next diagram kind of gets you in the mood for that. Oh, okay. And that's called a fractvert, there you go. And what this looks like is uh, someone took a wrong turn in building a vertical, but in fact, if you build this, you're going to have 3 dB a gain over a regular quarter wave, and you're going to have directionality. So it's actually a directional vertical antenna. I know that sounds like a contradiction, uh, but it really is true. And you can see there's three sections. The first section is a sixth of a wave high. Then there's a horizontal section, a quarter wave high, and a third section, which is a third of a wave high. And if you build that, for example, for, for 20 meters, you'll have a gain antenna that's directional. It'll point in the direction, in this case, over on the left. And it will also be uh, usable on 40 meters and 30 meters and so on. So if you want to try bending something very simple that's leading to understanding fractals, I strongly recommend just trying this. It's easy to build. You can hold it up with two pieces of rope and you'll be very happy with the results. Very cool, very cool. So um, is, is there a place they can go to pull up these diagrams if they want to try and build this at home? Uh, great question, because I had a lot of people coming up to me during, uh, during Dayton, and I had it, of course, on my tablet. But uh, I think what I should do is I'll put it on my bio page on QRZ, and people can just dig it out that way. Now, it actually was published many years ago in 73 Magazine, but it's harder to dig that out. So I'll put it up on my on my Z page, Valerie, and that way that people would be have great. access to it. That would be great, and it's called it's Whiskey One Yankee Whiskey. And um, now there's a lot of practical applications for the fractal antennas. I think uh, we got about three slides, yeah, that show um, if you can kind of, I'm sure I seeing an airport here. I mean, what are some of the practical applications that are used outside of ham radio? 
Sure. Well, they're used uh, in, in medical. They're used in RFID. They're used in um, uh, in tele telematics. Uh, used in public safety. Um, used uh, by Department of Defense and so on. Uh, some of the places you're likely to, to run into fractal antennas, if you look really hard, are places like airports and public buildings and universities and hospitals. And here's some places of examples of the things that they're on. Uh, if you, for example, fly in a 787, there's uh, many of my fractal antennas inside the new 787s, and uh, most of the commercial fleet uh, of jets uh, has have my antennas on their sides. And if you want to know what they look like, well, they're they're artistically beautiful, but frankly, most of the time, almost all the time, you won't see them at all because they're hidden away under a radom or they're built into some equipment and so on. But a lot of them look like interesting mazes. Uh, some of them look like um, like uh, zap cartoon diagrams from Batman. Uh, others look like uh, uh, diamond rings and uh, whatever your imagination tells you. But but each one of these different designs works for a particular purpose and works better than a conventional antenna for that purpose. Now, I also know you did something with invisibility cloaks. Why don't you tell us about invisibility cloaks? Sure. Um, well, uh, in, in 2003, I found a very interesting effect that happened when you put fractal antennas very close to one another. And uh, the effect was it, it, it made the RF travel along the surface as a so-called evanescent wave rather than necessarily bouncing back or going off on the side. And what I did is I ultimately decided to loop that back on itself. And the result of that was the first invisibility cloak that was uh, built uh, 2007, 2008, and uh, got the patent on that, I have several patents on it since. And in fact, in 2012, when the first patent came out, we decided it would be fun to do what everyone really wanted to do, which is to uh, cloak a person. Now, this is an invisible light. It's at microwaves, but it's the principle is the same, of course. And I think you have a picture of that, Valerie? I Not do. Sure. Uh, that's, I think that's the last photo, Victor, you, uh, of a guy with a thing around his body. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know okay. I've seen your YouTube video that you have where the guy is fully inside uh, a cloak, right? Sure. So, uh, it's too bad we can't move that over. Maybe if we can move it over a little to the left, because it's actually a composite photo of two images. Um, uh, this is the demo that we gave uh, uh, in 2012 at a Radio Club of America a technical symposium. And that was really fun because uh, it was shortly after the patent was issued. And what that gentleman is doing is, is he's not getting mugged in New York City. And that's why his arm's up. Uh, it's... Uh, he's got that collar on, and what the collar is doing is it's it's deflecting the RF around around his uh, abdomen and off to the other side. There's a another antenna that's off on, on the side of that picture, and we showed in real time the images before and during, and it was really quite exciting because everyone's kind of sitting around waiting to see what happens, and then you could see that uh, when he put the cloak on that the RF went back as if there was nothing in the way, and it got a lot of gasp and people stood up and it was an exciting moment. And in fact, uh, I think Gordo was there to see it if if memory serves. <laughs> yes, he was. He was there and he was very impressed with the, that whole presentation. Um, fun now stuff. I know you've got, what, 48 patents. Um, so yeah. what, what are you what are you working on right now? Um, I'm working on fractal electromagnets. Uh, a few years back, I played around. That's how a lot of this starts. And I took some uh, fractal shapes that we made with 3D printers and I started wiping around, winding around uh, magnet wire and discovered, of course, that I could make an electromagnet. And the strength of the electromagnet uh, was uh, identical to a larger electromagnet. Not surprisingly, because fractals are often taken advantage of to make things smaller. So it turns out that gets to be a very interesting uh, approach to doing electromagnets. And uh, we're producing larger ones now and seeing where it will take us. But basically, for a given uh, uh, magnetic field strength, you can shrink the size of the electromagnet 
uh, better than a fa factor of two compared to uh, a conventional electromagnet. Having fun with that. Well, this is very interesting stuff. I'm totally into this, and I know I we got to have you on again. Ten minutes just isn't enough. I want to hear more about the drone zappers next time. So oh, yeah, hopefully you you'll join us another time. <laughs> I, I'd love to. Thanks very much for having me on. Thanks, Chip, and congratulations on winning Technical Achievement, uh, a well-deserved award. Thank you very and, much. Uh, for those of Hi, you everybody. Who for those of you who want to learn more, go to his QRZ page, uh, Whiskey One Yankee Whiskey. Um, he'll put that stuff up there. Um, you know what? I'll put a link to the uh, cloaking thing from YouTube. I'll put it on my QRZ page, um, or he can. I'll see if he can put it on his. Um, but it's pretty interesting to watch the um, the radio waves before or and when he's not in the. You know, it's it's interesting video. Um, so thanks again, Chip. Um, also, want to welcome Dan. That was really nice on Show Us Your Shack and a fellow Wisconsinite. So that's cool. And uh, I. Little tidbit, uh, one of the Show Us Your Shack uh, victims, I should say, uh, Paul Bittner, Whiskey Zero AIH, that was in your uh, segment, was the one who married Jerry and I. He's also a reverend, <laughs> so that's probably kind of cool. So uh, as far as DX goes, we've got um, Kilo Hotel One. Those guys are getting ready. Uh, some of them are in Fiji, I think, right now, and some of them are in American Samoa. So they're getting ready to sail over to uh Baker for the Baker Howland D Expedition Kilo Hotel One. So uh, start to look for those guys on the air in uh, probably less than a week. Um, so uh, that's it for D Expeditions. Uh, everybody's gearing up for field day. I've got some really good stuff in the hopper for next week uh, regarding field day. So uh, I'm excited about that. So uh, that's all I've got for this week. So we're going to head it over to Don, who's going to talk about my favorite candy store. Amazing people in this hobby, don't we? Fractal antennas. Wow, the whole time I'm listening to this, I'm just absolutely amazed and uh, thinking to myself, man, I probably, probably should be sitting in the corner eating my crayons again. Just, just amazing. Chip, thanks for being on here. Well, you're going to have to have a nice antenna for field day, uh, probably not a fractal, probably something more along the traditional lines. But everything you need for your antenna needs, feed line needs, whatever it is, is right here especially for Field Day in the DX Engineering Catalog, Field Day 2018, right around the corner. I mean, literally days away. It's time to run down your must-have checklist. Make sure you have everything you need for a successful, successful Field Day. And DX Engineering wants you to remember that upgrading your coaxial cables, ladder lines, wire antennas will make a huge difference in how your stations perform. The DX Engineering branded 300 and 450 ohm ladder line handles full legal limit power, works with both receive and transmit applications and is an amazing choice for improved field day operations. If you're a ladder line person, there are 300 ohm ladder line is constructed of 18 gauge conductors, 19 strands of copper clad steel wire. The velocity factor is 0.88. It's ideal for use with multiband dipoles and other multiband antennas. The 450 ohm ladder line is constructed of 16 gauge conductors. It performs well with uh, the DX Engineering's reversible beverage antenna system. The wire makes the line strong enough for long horizontal runs between supports. And 300 ohm ladder line is available in lengths up to 500 feet. The 450 ohm ladder line can be purchased by the foot or in spools up to 1,000 feet. Ladder line supports are also available. Now don't wait until it's too late to make sure you have enough high performance cable to build a temporary station. Make DX Engineering your go-to cable coax cable source. Their low-loss cable assemblies are available in standard lengths with DX Engineering's patented PL259 connectors featuring the best qualities of both crimp-on and solder-on connections. Also available by the foot or in bulk, DX Engineering's 400 Max, 8U, 8X, and 11U coaxial cables feature ultra-low-loss gas-injected foam cable dielectrics to handle the elevated SWR of high-performance HF antennas. Of course, their online custom cable builder is there to build assemblies made to your exact, and I mean your exact, specifications. When it comes to portable operation, it's tough to beat the versatility and performance of a DX Engineering wire antenna kit. The Easy Build UWA Center T and End Insulator Kits let you build virtually any wire antenna type, folded dipole, inverted V, off-center fed, Wyndham, Zep, loops, and more. You can roll your own to your specifications. They feature an exclusive serpentine wire grip for insulated antenna wire and 300 ohm ladder line. Choose DX Engineering Premium Antenna Wire 
and you will see the difference over standard bare wire. The relaxed PVC insulated 14 uh, gauge stranded copper wire is uh, comprised of 19 strands of 27 gauge solid copper. It rolls out easy without coils and kinks, and it's available in lengths from 75 to 1,000 feet. You got to get on it. DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. Most orders placed by 10 p.m. Eastern are shipped the same day. With proven products and expert advice, DX Engineering helps you shrink the globe. Request your catalog or shop online 24-7 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. You need this catalog. You need to go on the website, and you need this catalog for sure. I mean, it's got everything you need for field day and everyday operating, too. And thank you so much, DX Engineering, for your help in the production of Ham Nation tonight. George, what's going on with Smoke and Solder? Well, Don, and Smoke and Solder tonight, first up, we've got a video here that uh, uh, Randy, K7AGE, did for us. He was, well, he's been out at the Ham Fest again. I'll just put it that way. And he's been visiting with some of our friends. So let's get a quick update on uh, CPAC from Randy. K7AGE, CPAC, short shots. You know you're in the right place when you see all the antennas on the vehicles. On Friday, CPAC hosted two workshops, one for emergency preparedness and the other for antenna modeling. On my way into the Hamfest, I came across Jerry and Amy each with a cup of coffee, and Jerry uh, pulled a KX2 out of her bag to show me. Good attendance at the CPAC Hamfest. About 2,100 people attended. Uh, lots of crowds on the floor in the flea market and the commercial exhibit areas. Lots of things to look at and buy. State-of-the-art radios from Flex. Helicraft was there. Jesu. Lots of radios, lots of HTs. In the swap meet area, lots of the older radios. Here's a, looks like a bunch of Kenwoods and people negotiating deals in the swap. So Will from ICOM was digging for something in the ICOM booth while Ray was over at the Pizza Harbor enjoying this nice sandwich. A ham fest is a good time to stock up on all your power pole goodies. Lots of parts and connectors. Found this in the flea market it was one of these old paper tape Morse code training devices. And actually, Jerry Ellsworth bought this thing, so maybe we'll see it in action on a video someday. Lots of test gear for sale. I bought this Tektronix TM500 frame that has a frequency counter in the left module, a digital voltmeter, a function generator, and a power supply. Over at AMSAT, they had a model of one of the little CubeSats. And there you can see the antenna coiled up around, and it's tied in with a piece of uh, fishing line and with a resistor, and they put current through the resistor. It heats up and breaks the line, and the antenna pops out. The DMR forum had lots of people there, a lot of interest in, in DMR. And another good thing to pick up at a ham fest is these little... Uh, perf boards for doing your your little projects and such so and i enjoyed spending a lot of time with my youtube and ham nation viewers and also with jerry and amy uh, learning about what they've been up to always very interesting cpac 2018 it was a good time be back next year thanks for that randy and looks like uh, another excellent cpac i've only ever been to that ham fest once and really had a great time there. I, I need to go back again soon. Uh, by the way, Randy wanted to mention that George, and I'm going to butcher his name, Byrkit, B-Y-R-K-I-T, uh, has posted a video of uh, Jerry's Tapper Banquet presentation that you might want to check out. I uh, know I'm going to. Uh, last week, you know, we talked about uh, getting ready for Phil Day. And in particular, I talked about some of the test equipment that you might want for field day. Some you'd be really uh, essential to having, and some that's optional. We're going to do the same thing tonight with tools, and we're going to be um, be starting out with just some of the bare essentials that you'll need tool-wise to have with you for field day. Uh, first up, well, you're going to need some screwdrivers, so uh, at least one flathead and one Phillips, preferably some that the blades are not worn out like these two I've got right here. Because uh, you never know. You, 
uh, if you're going to, you know, what, what it's going to take, uh, a flathead or a Phillips, better to have several sizes of those. But if uh, you're trying to narrow the toolkit down, at least one of each. Something else that's a definite must is a pair of pliers. Uh, you, you know, it's not good to use pliers on everything that you run across because you'll tear up nuts and stuff like that. But, hey, if you're working field day and you just got to get it done, uh, pliers are, are one thing that you're really going to want. Uh, you're going to want a knife, you know. Um, this is a little large, but uh, some kind of knife because you never know. You might need to strip some wire or what you may need to do, cut some uh, guy rope or, or whatever. So a knife. Need some uh, wire cutters, uh, probably some a little bigger than these right here, but this is what I had handy on the bench when I grabbed these tools earlier. Uh, but some wire cutters because, uh, you know, don't want to dull up the blade on your knife. Something else that you're going to want, uh, I would say for sure, is a soldering iron and uh, some solder because you could have a connector go bad. Now, this is a little butane iron here. It's very convenient, very handy, but if you take one of these, you better make sure you got a little bottle of butane with you as well. I don't know if this one gets hot enough to do PL259s, but this uh, particular ISO tip one here has a larger tip on it, so it's it might actually get hot enough to do a PL259 with. Uh, what you'll normally want, though, for that is something a little larger like... Uh, like this Weller right here, mine's a 100 and 140 watt version. Uh, you can see that I don't have the official Weller tip on it. I've just got uh, a piece of wire there out of some Romax that I made an emergency tip out of. And uh, I've just kind of continued using those for one reason or another. It's cheap and you've always got some wire around. So um, Weller soldering iron, our gun in particular, very handy to have. You probably want one of these, too. This is not a tool, but probably more than one. Some spare PL259s because you never know if you're going to end up with a bad coax. And it's a lot easier just to stick a new PL259 on than it is to cut off an existing one and clean it out when you're in a hurry like at field day. Uh, beyond that, there's some other tools that you might want. I will call these optional, although... It would be a good idea to have them, but we're trying to keep the toolkit light for this. First up, a pair of wire strippers would be handy. Um, you don't know what you're going to encounter there. You can use a knife if, if that's all you got, but uh, some type of wire strippers is convenient to have. A pair of needle nose pliers. Uh, those can be handy too. You, your regular pliers are good. And if you're only going to carry one pair, that's what you want. But needle nose are convenient as well. A pair of crimpers. You could need some crimpers. Uh, you might want some spare crimp terminals, but uh, I would say these are optional right here. However, if if you're using gear that has power pole connectors on the power cables. You might want to carry some spare power poles with you and a crimper for that. You can solder those, but uh, a crimper probably works better, especially if you've got a good crimper that was designed for the power poles. Using something like this, you can make it work, but it doesn't work as well. And one other tool item I'll mention here is a crescent wrench. That can be pretty handy for assembling antennas or whatever you may have uh, that needs to be put together. Now, there's a lot of other tools that you could have with you. And I myself, I'm probably going to be carrying my uh, uh, tool uh, bag or briefcase, actually, that Probably weighs 20 or 25 pounds, so I'll have a lot more tools than this with me. But I think the ones we covered tonight are the bare essentials that you'll want to have for field day. Because you don't want to get out there and have some kind of little uh, 
mishap or a, a bad cable or something like that just kind of uh, ruin the event for you because you can't can't get it repaired quickly. So just take a, a few moments, think about the gear you're carrying with you and what it might take to uh, assemble it or to make a field repair if you need to in an emergency. Well, that's it tonight for uh, our look at what we might want for field day next week. I don't know what we're going to do right now. We'll uh, we'll find out when we get here next week. May cover something else on field day. Uh, may do something totally different. But, you know, I asked a question uh, the last couple of weeks. What are you doing for field day this year? Uh, we did it last week and uh, had a winner on that. And that was so much fun doing it last week. I thought we would do it again. And I went through, uh, picked out a, a good entry here, I think, this time around. It is from Michael Courier Casavant, uh, N1XRR. Probably butchered his name, too. I'm, I'm, I'm good at that. He said, George, I'm headed to a remote cabin in Royal South Carolina with four friends who are all new hams. Uh, we're setting up an FT-991, a wire antenna, a generator, uh, and a laptop, and just having fun and learning about the event. Well, Michael, that is a great idea. Take some new hams out. Uh, kind of show them what field day is all about. doesn't have to be anything special. Uh, use what you got. Throw it together. Get on the air. Make a few contacts. If you're like... Uh, like the group I go with, we're not setting any records for sure. We're just out to have a good time and uh, check out our equipment, make sure that it works, uh, make sure that we can deploy it in a hurry if we need to anytime, and, uh, and just have some fun and fellowship. That's what it's all about for us. Uh, Michael, we're going to be sending you your choice of one of Gordo's books. It's a technician, a general class, or the extra class study guides for amateur radio. And being that you're carrying some uh, new hams out with you, uh, I don't know what your class is, but uh, if you haven't topped out at extra yet, uh, by all means, tell Gordo you want uh, whichever class you need, uh, which I'm going to assume is probably, if you're not already an extra, you, uh, you probably want to do that. But if not, then maybe get a general or uh, our extra book, whatever one of your friends there needs. Uh, thanks, uh, Gordon West Radio Schools, for making that available. And uh, also the folks over at uh, W5YI. Next week, I'm going to ask that same question again because I've been getting some good answers there. And uh, I'd, I'd like to know um, something unusual that somebody's doing, like the... Uh, Going to the cabin there in uh, rural South Carolina sounds like a good, good fun thing to me. We're going to the woods uh, way off the grid here in Mississippi and pitch a tent and do field day. What are you going to do? Well, send me an email, hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you might win one of these. It's the Hall Ham Radio Handbook. It's the last one I've got here in the shack that I'm giving away. Um so get in on that. Tell me what you're going to be doing for field day. Hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and we'll put your name in the hat and uh, pick out a good field day story for next week. And now Amanda has been uh, standing by in the chat room. I know she's probably got a few questions, maybe a couple of announcements to make there. Amanda, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing excellent. A little smoky here in Colorado, but otherwise uh, not too bad. Let's see. George, I have some comments for you. I think you listed pretty much all the tools you needed, but there were a couple of suggestions. So first one, a persuader bar, meaning a BFH, a big flipping hammer or sledgehammer, um, trash bags. And I don't, I didn't watch all of it. So I don't know if you listed duct tape, but if you didn't, you need that as well. <laughs> and viewers, let us know in chat if uh, George missed anything else. We like to call him out on these kind of things. Oh, and I do believe that one time 
you and Tommy required a potato gun or something like that yes. on a field day. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and we did. Our friend Jim brought the potato gun that uh, was powered by hairspray. It did a real good job, but uh, since then we've been using slingshots. And let me just say, that's not the best way to go. <laughs> we need something different. So, uh, but that's probably what we'll be using this year again. Uh, we we might in the future try the drone idea that we saw here. Uh, Valerie had a guest on showing us the other day. Or was it Val that had that or Bob? It was Bob. Uh, it was Bob. Bob. Uh, we might try that because Tommy's got a real nice drone, and uh, yeah, that looked like a fun way to do it too. Well, that's a high tech way to do it. I know I would have fun doing that, unless there's dogs in the area. My dogs do not like the drones and chase them, and I actually broke the camera off of ours. So you know, there's that. <laughs> Thanks, George, for that. Um, I do have one announcement, maybe two. Uh, KY4GPD, that's Matt, we're friends on Facebook. He just upgraded to general this last weekend. Congratulations, Matt. We can't wait to make a contact with you on HF. And it's such a hard hurdle to get over. It really is. And um, once you get there, then you get really stoked to advance even further up to extra. So and the other the other one I wanted to mention is WP4QER. Mrs. Carmen, um, she, Mrs. Carmen Anderson, I should say, she just got her call sign down there in Puerto Rico with Andy, and she just made her first contact, I guess, on uh, D Star. Is that correct, Val? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just reading. Uh, darn it, who'd she make it with? Um, K A J K. Yeah, Kilo A Julia Tango Kilo. So, congratulations, Carmen. Nice. Welcome to the family, Carmen. Yes, definitely. Welcome to the family. You're, she's going to be hooked. And I think Andy said last week on chat, he said, now every now she wants it. Now she wants to hold the radio. Now she wants to listen. So there you go. The shack is now doubled. Welcome to our world. Welcome right. to our world. You you too, I'm sure. Yep. Right. Two of everything. All the time. And it's, you're invading my space. Get out of here. I'm trying to make this contact. And they have something <laughs> yeah, else. I want to get on the radio. Yeah. Exactly. That's hilarious. All right. I do have one other thing, Val. Um, this person didn't have a name. Web1990 wanted to know if you liked your earrings that you got in Dayton. Yeah, I wore them all day that day. I even wore them, uh, I think I wore them on my wedding day. They're, they're cute little purple earrings his wife made for me. I haven't worn the scarf yet, thank God, because it's really thick knit scarf. <laughs> and it's, uh, We'll be wearing that one until hopefully December. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for all the little goodies you gave me at Dayton. Oh, that's awesome. Um, the only other thing I have to say is I'm just excited for field day. I I get giddy. I get so excited. I love to be the welcomer. And I also want to demand to be on the radio the whole time. So I'm always torn. Uh, Don, you don't really, you don't do a lot of field day stuff, do you? I used to do it a lot, but uh, since we moved up here to Picayune, um, now I go to the local club, the uh, uh, the club here in, in uh, Pearl River County, uh, Mississippi, occasionally. Uh, I actually need to pay my dues. I'm a couple of years behind, I think. But uh, used to do field day quite often when I was uh, a member of the West Side Amateur Radio Club down in New Orleans. I was president of that club a couple of times and used to take my motorhome out. And we did field day from my motorhome when whatever park we decided to, decided to invade. So I love field day. I just, just so busy now. Life has gotten a lot more complex in the last 20 years or so. And uh, uh, just don't, don't do it as much as I would like to. Yeah. Well, and, and your um, son is now licensed, so you should, you and him should do a little camping adventure. Uh, yeah, well, so. we gotta, yeah. I mean, as long as uh, as long as six is open, he could, uh, and six and ten, he could rack them up on six and ten since he's just a tech. Well, he can operate on field day. He could just use your. Call that's sign. true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you'll be, that's as exactly long as you're right. watching him. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Give, we'll him, to see. give him the bug. And then he'll be like, oh, dad, I've got to upgrade. This is awesome. So yeah, even uh, if Val we just do it from. Even if we just do it from here, maybe if we yeah. have time, maybe we'll get to yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Just be a one Delta. That'll be fun. Yeah. I've I'll done that before too. You. Val, what awesome. are you guys doing? Two Alpha up in McQuanago, Wisconsin with my same field day group. We always have a blast up there and uh, really looking forward to that. I know it's Beasley's favorite time of year. Field day. 
<laughs> He's a field day dog. Well, I know we're going to talk a whole lot more about this next week. So stay tuned. It's going to be our field day special edition of Ham Nation. But I just, I get so excited. I can't, I can't not talk about it now. I've already got meals planned. I've got the the <laughs> tents cleaned out. I am ready. The only thing I need to do is like rewash my sleeping bag because dogs. So uh, I got to get the dog hair out of there, but um, I'm excited. All right. That's all I have. Let's go over some nets. We have 71.92 for the 40 meter net. 20 meter is going to be on 14.268. Steve is hosting that tonight. 14 Charlie for the D star net. Go out there and say hello to Carmen in Puerto Rico. I know they're listening. And uh, do drop in for the Echo Link. And I'm missing one. DMR, TAC 311. Don't miss them. They're a good time. Who's wrapping this up? I guess it's me since I kicked it off. I guess that'll do it for, uh, for all of us tonight. We've had some amazing content on the show tonight. I mean, everything from field day to fractal antennas to tools to uh, show me your shack. Just just a ton of stuff okay. tonight. So uh, another good show. And uh, we want to thank you for, for being here and supporting what we do here. So uh, for Bob Hall, who hopefully will be back next week, and uh, Gordon and Val and Dan and George and Amanda, we'll, uh, we'll say goodnight to you uh, for now, and we'll see you again next week here on Ham Nation. So good night, everybody. 7-3, and have fun at Field Day.